Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 43. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Brandon Turner. Thanks for not giving me a nickname this week, Josh. Oh man, you you know I, you've been crying the past couple episodes, so I figure I'd I'd, I'd be uh, I'd go easy on you. Tears have been shed. They have indeed. They have <laughs> indeed. How you been, man? Doing good? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing great. I'm uh I'm doing great actually. Yeah. Uh, Thanksgiving's right around the corner, and we're excited for that. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're at show forty three. This is forty three weeks in a row. Forty third week of the year. It, it it's crazy. Yeah, it has been crazy. We're coming up on the big five zero. So yeah, we're, you know. It's uh, it's bananas, but uh, let's let's uh, jump into this one. We've got uh, kind of a cool show today with uh, with Sean Riley uh, from Newton, Mass. Sean is a uh, buy and hold investor who became a house flipper, who also has uh, purchased properties at long distance. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to cover lots of cool stuff. Like, you know, what do you do if you live in an area that's pretty expensive? Yeah. Uh, how to get how to get started and, and things like that. Um, we we uh, we we talk about you know craziness craziness like buying a house that that has railroad tracks in its backyard and sewage plants in, <laughs> in the front. Um, you you will be amazed at at what you can make money with. So uh, check it out. Pay attention. If you've got any questions for Sean, check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show forty three, and uh, be sure to ask him your questions there or check him out on the site. And uh, otherwise, let's just jump in. What do you think? Let's let's do it. Uh, by the way, I like how you said Mass instead of trying to say the whole name of the state. Let's hear you say it, Josh. Massachusetts. Let's I hear you say I'm it, not Brandon. Say it. <laughs> Come on, oh, you can say it I twice. Said it, I said it during the show once, and it was uh, awkward. It, it was awkward. I worked my way through it. <laughs> <laughs> Brand, mass. Brand, Brand, That's all it's called. Yeah, Mass. It's easy. It's easy. Yes. So so uh, anyway, let's do it. All right, Sean. So uh, welcome to the show, man. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Us too. All right. So, Sean, let's get down down and dirty here, man. All right. What kind of uh, investor are you? I do a couple different things. So I started off as a uh, buy and hold locally. And uh, after a couple of years, I started getting into doing um, fix and flips in my area in Massachusetts. And then... Um, a little over a year ago, I also started getting involved with out-of-state rentals. Right. Okay. Hey, what's <laughs> the what's the market look like where you're at? Because I know some area of Massachusetts is very expensive. Most of Massachusetts is relatively expensive, even in the you know the real boonies and stuff like that. It's still more expensive than all you know, like um, a lot of places in the country. Right around road. me, I'm. <laughs> yeah, okay. my, my area is pretty boonies. <laughs> Well, I live right outside of Boston, so it's very expensive here. As I'm saying, like I'm in, you know, four or five hundred thousand dollar condo land. Ooh, ooh, nice. yeah, that's got to be Cambridge. Oh yeah, lots of them in Cambridge. I'm in Newton, which is um, right close to Cambridge, bot- borders Boston. Um, it's where Boston College is. Uh, yes. I have one of my high school teachers um, uh, didn't like it very much, so we would always call it the University of Newton. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I actually lived right on the reservoir at uh, BC after college. It was uh, it's kind of a fun place to be. It's a cool town for seventeen to twenty one year olds. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, actually, so I lived in I lived in Brighton, right um, near Newton, where you're talking about. Uh, so we actually probably we had places pretty close to each other at that point. Nice, nice, awesome. All right, so you started buy and hold, went to flipping, and then got to out of state rentals, and and I guess we'll we'll kind of cover that tran- that transition. How did you originally get into buy and hold? So um, I had actually been interested in real estate for quite a few years, had read a lot of books, did a lot of studying, wanted to get into cash flowing rentals. Um, we had, me and my wife bought our um, first place, which was that condo in Brighton I was just referring to. Um, <clears throat> it was actually the, we bought on the wrong side of a flip back in 2004. And then in 2007, we wanted to move to a place that was a bit bigger um, because we were starting to think about starting a family and stuff. And a 663 square foot two bedroom condo was probably not where we were going to (laughs) be raising a family. Um, But as I said, we bought in 2004, went to sell in 2007, as opposed to eating like, you know, $30,000 or something to sell the place. We decided to turn it into a rental because we thought we you know, we should at least be able to cover our costs, which we have been able to do. Um, and we had actually always joked that it was so close to BC that it would always make a good um, a good rental property if we didn't have to sell it. Uh, so that's how we got started there. Um, so then after that, as I said, I'd already kind of been interested. So that sort of kind of got, you know, give me the little kick in the pants to get started. And uh, we like the fact that people are just mailing us money every month. That's always so, nice. Yeah, I'll take it. So uh, what we did after that is um, I I grew up north of Boston, a city called Lowell, which is right near New Hampshire, um, one of the other bigger cities in Massachusetts. Boston dwarfs everything else, but after that, it's one of the bigger cities in the state. Um, so I grew up right outside of that, and most of my dad's family still lives there and stuff like that. So I knew the area pretty well. I was like, hey, you know, we can probably buy the same unit for like less than – Bit like probably about forty percent of what we paid for our place in Brighton, and we could get you know somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the rent. So uh, we're like, hey, you know, let's start looking there. We actually bought two almost identical units uh, there. Uh, you know, six eight months after we first started. Were these condos as well? Yes. Okay. Okay. Actually, all my stuff in Massachusetts are condos. Really? Okay. For well, rentals. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, well. Let's let's kind of talk about that a little bit because you know a lot of people will will shy away from uh, from from condos. I I know that I uh, I had a condo experience myself that that did not go well. Um, I I loved where I lived. This was in in uh, SoCal, and uh, you know uh, inherited a board of directors that that. You know, felt like running a board was like running the universe, and they got very power hungry over a a you know forty fifty uh, unit building, and and uh, you know started going crazy and and doing bad things, and it gave me a very bad taste for for uh, living in such a place or ever owning a rental in such a place because you know you're at the you're you're at the uh, mercy of of those folks, so. Have you ever had any similar experiences or, or how's so it been I would, you? There's definitely, you know, there's, those things are definitely risks. Um, I have dealt with, my places range from anywhere from just five units all the way up to several hundred. Um, so like the small ones, you know, they're generally self-managed and stuff. So it really does depend if you have good people there. I've actually been pretty lucky and um, for that really, really small one, um, the person who's in charge, the trustee there is like awesome and um, is very easy to work with, very nice, does a good job of keeping things in order. Um, we do have actually in our biggest complex, we had something kind of similar to what you had, like the, you know, the, there were a couple of people who had been on the board forever and just had like, you know, crazy power trips. Mm-hmm. Um, one was eventually voted out, which was very nice. But like for the first couple of years, we like if I went to the associ- the association meeting and stuff, like literally they had to have like cops and like the attorneys and stuff there <laughs> just to like keep wow. things in order. Really, that's but it cash flowed. So <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. Well, well, the big thing for me was these guys didn't want to get uh, earthquake insurance. And uh, living in Southern California, California is kind of a big deal. Yeah, you know, or, you know, I owned the uh, everything between my my four walls, but but you know, the building itself didn't have coverage, and and that was uh, that was a bit that was a bit troubling. So 
Interesting. So, so you put up with that stuff and continued to, to acquire condo properties after that. You're a braver did, man than I, I am. I slow down for a while, but that was actually more because, um, you know, like a lot of first time investors who, you know, buy rentals like the books tell you to do. Yeah. Um, they don't, they don't make you nearly as much money as you were um, hoping. Yep. So kind of got in a holding pattern for a while. I've only bought one since those first three here. Okay. Uh, but I did buy, it was another condo and it was in the same area and the same basic unit and stuff. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, overall, the thing I like about condos, especially if you're getting started and, you, you know, you have to do your due diligence on the association and all that kind of stuff, yep. is that if you want to self-manage your properties, it's a lot easier because typically, as you were saying, like, you know, you're responsible for inside your four walls, but you don't have to worry about exterior maintenance. You don't yep. have to worry about, you know, cutting the grass, pl plowing the snow, you know, fixing a leaky roof, any of that kind of stuff. Like the association is in charge of that. No, you pay for that. That's yeah. why you have to, you know, you have to evaluate the fees and make sure it's worth it. But, um, you know, yeah. if you consider that to just be part of your property management fees and your reserves and stuff like that, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good way to kind of get your feet wet because you don't have to deal with every single issue. You only have to deal with the stuff, like I said, inside your yeah. actual yeah. units. So easier to self-manage. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the, I think the scariest part other than the board is, is really the, those one-off assessments that that tend, tend to pop up every uh couple of years or every year depending I've on your board three deck assessments and i don't have a single unit with a deck yeah so yeah. They, they, that kind of stuff is frustrating yeah it could be it could be for sure so yeah yeah uh, so for those people listening you know c condos do have their benefits for sure uh but there are also certainly negatives uh, obviously, look at your own risk tolerance and decide if 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 uh, an investment in a condo is is really for you. But you know, if the numbers work and you're willing to put up with it, then then it it could definitely be a a good deal. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's great. So so the, this condo thing, you 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 picked up a bunch of condos. Did you continue? Um, as a buy and hold guy, were you continuing to pick up? Did you move to like single families from there, or or was that kind of the you know what I'm going to move on to flipping houses now? So what happened was um, so after we got those first three units, the you know the converted primary and the first two that we bought. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, as I said, um, you know, like a lot of people didn't didn't turn out to be as good of investments as I necessarily thought uh, initially. So kind of got in a holding pattern for a while sort of blew our wad with uh, down payment money and stuff like that. And also, you know, since they weren't doing as well as we wanted, wanted to kind of take a step back and reevaluate how we want to do stuff. Um, you know, these weren't like killer investments where it's like, oh, you know, ended up going bankrupt and lost all the properties of foreclosure. It's just kind of like, you know, instead of cash flow and, you know, 200 bucks a month, it's more like break even. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we still kind too. of, Yeah. Yeah, so we kind of so we kind of got in a holding pattern for a couple of years. Sort of built my network and my knowledge. Kept going to my local RIAs and other real estate meetings and stuff like that. And then always kind of wanted to get interested into the flipping stuff too. So just kind of like kept learning about that and sort of just you know kind of one day something just kind of like clicked and uh, you know started just putting out tons and tons of offers to try to you know acquire some properties and you know started getting some and. Ever since then, have uh, you know most? I said mostly been doing that around here. I did pick up one new rental locally uh, about a little over a year ago. Um, which actually, so just to show um, what I learned in five years is that the um, it was it was also a condo in Lowell, more or less the same unit that I had bought the other two times, but I paid half as much. Oh. Ah, there you go. So that was cash flow is a lot better. Yeah, yeah. sounds like it. <laughs> I'll take it. That's cool. So, so you started flipping then at that point. How did, I guess, what was your first flip look like? Did you mean to flip it or I guess how'd that start? So, um, like most people initially, I was thinking it's like, oh, you know, I should probably get into wholesaling because it'll be <laughs> quicker, easier, um, than, you know, going through a whole rehab process. Cause you know, I don't necessarily have enough money or connections or and I've never done it before, blah, blah, blah. So, um, as I said, one day I just sort of, sort of clicked that it's like, you know, if I don't, basically it was like, if I don't start putting out offers, I'm never going to buy a property. So I started putting in tons and tons and tons of offers. Like, you know, basically the month I decided to really get into it, I probably put in like 200 offers. Nice. 
Now, a lot of like kind of throwing stuff against the wall, like didn't really expect there to be any traction and there wasn't. Um, right. But, you know, eventually I did get um, started getting some inquiries and stuff. So the first place I got under contract, I had hoped to wholesale. And I did work towards that. I actually had a buyer all lined up and um, he was using hard money and basically his lender backed out the day before the closing. So like, you know, he was scrambling and I was trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, it was it was a bank owned HUD property. So we were going to double close. So, you know, I, I, you know, I had to perform or lose it or you could get an extension i did get a short extension and you know i had to pay like you know, like 300 bucks to get like a two-week extension or something okay um hoping that he would be able to get his finances in order so he wasn't able to pull it together so i at that point i was sort of at a decision point and i was like you know i know this is a deal it's like you know i've i've been studying this forever i've been putting in these offers i've been evaluating stuff and it's like i just know i know there's like a ton of profit in this deal so I was like, you know what, I'll close on it and then I'll just, I'll keep marketing to see if I could wholesale it. Uh, so I did eventually close. It was like, for, for Massachusetts, it was ridiculously cheap. It was like $34,000 I think I paid. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Sounds like the, I won't say it. <laughs> um, it needed more work than that. <clears throat> but, you know, so, but I was able to acquire, actually, I remember at one point I looked up and it was like, since it was an MLS deal, um, I looked it up on MLS, and it was like the cheapest any house had gone for. This was in Chicopee, Massachusetts. This was way west, um, you know, probably about eighty-five miles outside of Boston, um, which was actually part of the problem. Is I didn't have a network out there, mm -hmm. yep. but it was like the cheapest place that went on MLS for like three or four years before that, and nothing cheaper since then. So that was one of it's like you know what? If nobody has bought anything anywhere near this cheap, it's got to be pretty good. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I tried, kept marketing it, did, had a few tire kickers, you know, did like the Craigslist thing, the going to the RIAs thing. Well, what's funny is there was actually a, um, RIA that was out of Springfield, Massachusetts, which is the border, a border, big border town that like literally closed maybe like a month before I <laughs> got the property. <laughs> nice. I was like, oh, I'll just go out to the Springfield place. I'm sure there'll be buyers there. And then the next closest one was one in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is the second biggest city in the state and, you know, probably 30 or so miles from there. Um, but I'm like, well, that's probably where everybody's going to be going now. And that one literally closed like the week. I, I Luckily, I checked to make sure it was still, you know, to get the address. I um, went online to check it out and it literally had just closed. Oh, so I was like, oh, well, I'm glad I didn't drive all the way out there to pitch the thing. <laughs> wow. All right. So, so you got this property under contract. You decide you're going to close. Obviously, it sounds like you, you had the, uh, the cash to close yourself. Um, so you were able to... to actually do that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have to do anything too dramatic. Um, I did have some cash. Uh, to be honest, I took like a huge credit card advance. Okay. Um, to pay for it. So you know, it's one of the other things people demonize sometimes is using a credit card. But uh, in this particular case, I had uh, you know a zero percent for thirteen month kind of offer. So I just yeah. you know took the money out. That was more than enough to close on it. Oh. I've done that a few times now. Yeah, I know people do demonize that, don't they? And I I even am guilty, you know, of, of Telling people, you know, be very, 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 very careful in doing that, and maybe don't do it at all. Well, but I do it, so. and I'm the one who demonizes it. So know, you know, y'all can look at yeah. me and make your little devil eyes at me. And well, it's like I know, bad. I know it's dangerous. It's kind of like you know, I don't know. There's a lot of bad vices in the world, but it, but it's worked for me, and it hasn't messed me up yet. So, well, I'm if you get a zero careful. percent loan for the 13, 16 months, I mean, it shoot, it's better than hard money. I mean, yeah. well, that's that's my point. Is if you yeah. get that kind of deal, it's like, well, why is it better to get a secured loan at like you know yeah. twelve to fifteen percent with the same transactional fees for the same time period? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, listen. I mean, I, I if if you look at it from that perspective, I I think, you know, using a card on a you know with with an offer like that is is probably your best option if if you don't have the cash. Yeah, I wouldn't do the yeah, 30% cash advance fee or whatever the, you know, like the really crazy cash advance charges, but yeah, those checks are nice. Yeah, so these things are usually only either a 3 or 4% transaction fee, which is, yeah. you know, that's pretty typical what you're going to pay for hard money points. Yeah. So you just avoid paying, like I said, the double digit interest and all the other closing costs. And if, you know, if God forbid you actually do default on it, you don't lose the property. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. There you go. There you go. All right. So you've, you've got this property now. 
you've been shopping it around to the clubs that don't exist, that <laughs> yep. whose stores close and are conspiring against you, and uh, you decide, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and flip this. Is it? Uh, is that exactly? Kind of- so that's what happened when I, you know, when I was having a hard time wholesaling. Like I, said, I got, I got a few tire kickers like off of Craigslist, and I actually called some of the We Buy Houses people who were out there, um, who did not get back in touch with me, <laughs> which I was like, whoa. <laughs> Dang. Um, but so then I was like, you know, I just know there's profit here. So my biggest concern was, as I said, it, it was well out of my general area, so I didn't have a contractor out there. But somebody who I had been, so I hadn't done any flip shit, but somebody who I had formed a relationship with and had been looking at some local properties with agreed to go out there and take a look at the job. And his quote was well within my budget. So we just went for it. And uh, he said, you know, it um, it worked out very well and you know, made, uh, you know, well over 30 grand on that first flip. Whoa. So then I was like, I was, I was like, um, you know, I was only looking to make about four on the wholesale. So then I was like, no, oh, this rehabbing thing seems to be the better way. Yeah. To go. There you go. Well, there that is, go. that is an interesting thing about wholesaling, right? Like if you're a really good wholesaler and you can get those amazingly cheap deals, it's hard to, it, it's hard to pass those deals up as a flipper and then hand them, you know, hand them over to somebody else to make the 30 grand. I mean, I understand the velocity thing, but yeah, that, that's where I struggle. Anytime I get a good enough deal that I could wholesale, why would I wholesale it? I, well, so, I mean, I, I, the way I see it, wholesalers, really, their job is the marketing. I mean, they're marketers versus, right. um, versus flippers who are more <clears throat> jobbers, I guess. Is, maybe that's a, a way of describing it. And, and I don't mean negative on either of them. But, you know, the wholesaler, your job is to get that flow, right? You want to work, 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 and get as many leads as possible, as quickly as possible, and you want to dump them as fast as possible. Yeah, you, know, you can have 10, 20, 30 deals in a month. You can't flip 10, 20, 30 deals in a month yeah, so unless think, you have a huge you know, infrastructure. The, yeah, I think that's the big thing is just the difference in volume. So, yeah. you know, subsequently, um, I did wholesale, I have wholesaled some properties, but it's, or I said wholesaled a property. Um, that uh, you know, at the time I actually had like a lot of stuff coming in. Um, you know, it was it was a very magical time where it was the second property I got under contract that day after getting one under contract two days earlier and had multiple projects going. So it's like, oof, it's actually going to be hard to get stuff going. So I wasn't able to wholesale that, but for the most part, I don't get enough leads that I can't handle them. Yep. So, you know, if I started having more projects that I could reasonably take on at once, um, you know, I'd be looking at that more. And subsequently, over the last couple of years, um, I have built up a stronger network, even out in that western part of the state where I had a hard time wholesaling this first one. So I'm not, I don't worry about um, getting stuff in places that I would not necessarily want to do the job myself because I do, I am much more confident that I can, you know, dump them if I needed to. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So where, where are you getting your leads from? So. Um, up until about a year ago, I was pretty much exclusively doing stuff on the MLS because there was enough bank-owned stuff um, that you know there were, I was able to get deals, and I was putting in you know, just putting in a lot of offers and getting things to work out. Um, especially, I did pretty well with HUD around here. Um, like I said, that first one was a HUD, and I got quite a few other ones that way. Since then, it's definitely been the the MLS, like a lot of places in the country, have dried up a lot. So I'm actually currently just getting a lot of my direct marketing to motivated sellers going. So, uh, you know, I have not purchased any properties from that yet, but um, I'm definitely working on it. Um, You know, if people see me on the forums, I've been pretty active in a lot of the ones talking about, like, you know, direct mails and stuff like that to try to get new ideas and been blogging about my uh, stuff on my BP blog yeah. to kind of keep, uh, keep myself accountable. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and, and they can check that out. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll link to, to, to that on the show notes at, at biggerpockets.com slash show 46. Um, but so, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit and maybe we could jump back to, to the flipping stuff afterwards. Um, so direct marketing to motivated sellers, you, you know, you're, you're new to this, which, which makes yep. it actually uh, kind of interesting you know, what strategy have you, uh, did you decide to go with, you know, after doing all this research, you know, what, what are you running with? Who are you targeting specifically in terms of the motivated guys? And, uh, how, how is that going? I mean, obviously you haven't closed the deal yet, but you know, fill us in a little bit. So, um, the main, uh, you know, main form that I'm trying to use is direct mail. 
because uh, based on you know what I've talked to people locally and uh, you know most of the stuff that I've read on bigger pockets has you know convinced me that that is probably the most effective way to go. Um, so I've been working on that. In addition to that, I've been doing you know some of the more low hanging fruit like posting Craigslist ads, getting in touch with people who post you know post for sale ads there. Um, I finally um, took the plunge into tacky and started putting signs on my car. <laughs> nice. Oh, uh, um, yeah. How does <laughs> how does the fam feel about that? Uh, you know, my wife has been surprisingly not bad with it. <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly <thought> mediocre. <laughs> well, like, she hasn't said like take them off or anything, but which I was worried she might be like, oh, I, I can't. You know, at least when we do go places together. I, I figured she'd probably be okay. Like when I was by myself, but like, you know, when I take him to like a kid's birthday party or something like that, like she doesn't ask me to take him off the car. Nice. So <laughs> that's kind of where I thought she would go. So, you know, she, she's been cool with that. Nice. nice. Um, you know, just a lot of the common stuff, like, you know, leaving stacks of business cards in different places and, you know, those kind of like, you know, simplistic things that aren't particularly effective, but are easy to do. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so as far as the direct mail, um, I've only been doing, not even quite a month yet, um, been sending stuff out, been doing it in sort of chunks um, to just start getting stuff out. Cause I was sort of like working on a list for a long time. And then I realized, you know, if I wait to fully refine everything I'm doing, I'm never going to send out any mail. Yeah. So uh, I started sending out stuff a little more piecemeal. And who are you sending and to specifically? I am sending to out-of-state absentee owners. Okay. Uh, the main reason for that is that it was a list I was able to compile myself for free. There you go. So I figured that was a good way to start until, you know, kind of keep the cost down until I figure get a better strategy and kind of feel my way through the actual process. And how were you able to get those for free? Uh, I am a licensed agent and was able to pull the information off MLS. Okay, yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking. Do you, it was actually for the Massachusetts MLS. There's, it's a um, pretty easy system, and actually, um, Mike Lacava in one of his articles a couple months ago, um, you know, showed the process for that. So that's actually where I learned how to do it. Oh, that's awesome! On the bigger pockets. Ah, look at that power of bigger pockets. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so, do you recommend other people getting their real estate agent, li- you know, license? I ask a lot of our guests this. I think I'm going to come down where everybody who has their license says that they should. Yep. <laughs> because I, I found it pretty beneficial to, uh, you know, if for nothing else, just for the MLS access and the ability to put in my own offers on stuff that is like bank owned and short sales and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So you're not paying the commissions. You can expedite the rate at which you get it done. You don't have to wait for somebody else to respond to you. Those are those are definitely benefits. Yeah, I, I like it. I especially like it on the buy side because, like I said, I can research stuff on MLS. I can comp stuff out. I can go do my own visits without having to schedule with a realtor, and I can put in my own offers. And which would come in handy when, you, like you said, you're putting in you know a couple hundred offers in that first month. Like your exactly. agent, no agent's going to want to do that for some. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. So you have no, you know, it, because we, we talk with, with a bunch of agents, um, Brandon and I, and, and we're always asking them, Hey, how can we improve the relationship between agents and investors and agents? Lo and behold, we'll always say, you know, get them to stop doing that crap where they yeah. send out a ton of offers that, <laughs> that have little chance of, of succeeding. And, uh, and you, you think about it, how, how on earth can you get, you know, a hundred offers out that, you know, with, with a one or two or three, four or 5% success rate, you know, a lot of, most agents are going to tell you to piss off, right? Yep. So really the, yeah, the only way to do it is to do it on your own. Yeah. I mean, if, if somebody else was asking me to put out as many offers as I put out as an agent just for the commission, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I saw yeah. a thing yesterday on a Facebook group. I'm part of, you know, a real estate agent Facebook group. And somebody had complained just about that. They said, you know, investors are asking me to put in, you know, 50 hours a month worth of work at, just to make, you know, the potential of making a few hundred bucks in commission on a $12,000 house. Like, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, there's no, there's no incentive for these agents at all. And, and that's I mean, we need to understand as investors. Yeah, and I mean, I think it'll be... I think in my area, I actually have better success like working with agents because even like the 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 beater up like needs tons of workplaces are at least approaching a hundred thousand dollars. So like yeah. you know they actually are getting you know a reasonable commission on the buy side. 
And uh, so even though I'm an agent, I'm perfectly happy to work with other agents. So like when I network and I meet people, I was like, hey, I'm an agent, but if you bring me a deal, you can write the offer for me and I'll list the resale with you. Oh, okay. okay. So that's sort of their incentive. Okay. Nice. No, that's cool. And I actually do list uh, quite a few of my flips with um, other agents just because, um, you know, I just don't think I'm that great at selling places. I do <laughs> list some of my own stuff and it's like places that are close to me or if there's like, you know, uh, some particular reason why I don't think that I could use like a local person with a specialized knowledge and stuff like that. Um, but I would you know, probably sixty percent of the places I've um, resold, I've had with other agents. That that is really interesting to me because you yeah. know a lot of yeah. a lot of investors say, you know, all an agent's doing is sticking it on the MLS and that's it. So why am I paying them, you know, three or six percent or whatever just to stick it on the MLS? So I would love to get your take on that. Like, what does a good agent do to sell a house that just throwing it on the MLS uh, doesn't accomplish? <sighs> it's. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Like I have overall had better success selling my places fast when I've listed them with other people. Okay. But you know, I kind of go back and forth. I would say half the time when I list a place myself, like you know, I sell it pretty easy, and then I save on the commission. I'm just like, Ugh, why do I, you know, why do I waste that money listing with other people? <laughs> and yep. then the other half of the time, it is such a pain in the butt that I'm like, oh my god, this is the worst three percent I ever could have saved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, a good agent, I, I, I think I could answer that. I mean, as a former agent who was never particularly good either, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wasn't a list, you know, I did, I was a buyer's agent. I was never a listing agent. But, you know, I, I think what I saw that the good listing agents did was they, they got a lot of energy um, for, for the listing beforehand. And, and uh, you know, a, there's that that age old argument about open houses. Open, you know, agents all complain that open houses are, are useless. But you know, I, I I think if the house looks good and the house is ready to go, an open house can sell your house pretty pretty fast. So you know, getting energy about the house, getting it out to other agents, you know, making making deals with other agents and and letting them know that you've got this you know this great property. Um, you, you know, it just like an investor, it's about networking. So a good agent is going to be somebody who's very well networked, who's tight with the other, the other investors in the area and who has the capacity to, to go out and basically bring you buyers. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. So if you, if you've got a good agent, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to have a lead funnel, just like uh, an investor is going to have a lead funnel as well. And, uh, you know, they're just going to have the capacity to do that. I I think, you know, that's really the biggest difference between a good agent and a quote mediocre agent is, you know, and the other, the other thing is also just the willingness to spend the money on the marketing. Um, you know, good, good agents will, will spend money and they'll market it because they know they're going to see it back and they'll put their name all over the neighborhood. They'll do whatever they have to do because it will come back and pay, uh, pay itself back. The, the mediocre ones tend to chintz out, I think, um, on, on, uh, on, on their spend. That's just my, my, my take on it. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's pretty accurate overall. Um, so, you know, when I have, like I said, when I've listed with other people, generally I've had better success moving the places pretty quick. Not always, but, you know, um, generally I think I've had more advantages that way. I've never really gotten any traction, either open houses I've done or the ones that they've done. But something that they bring to the table usually that I um, don't really have is they do broker opens. So yeah. they get other agents through there, which is a big thing. So my office is a small, independent, quote unquote, investor friendly office. Like the the little like motto is like you know investors working with other investors. So like yeah. you know all the agents more or less are doing their own kind of investing as well. That's so cool. like we don't have like a strong retail branch. Yeah. So these other people can bring in like people from their offices, and if they're you know with one of the bigger companies, some of the other um, uh, local offices. Yeah, yeah. I I think broker opens um, are. are- you know, they're, I'd say they're probably more valuable than than uh, just a, a, a open house to consumers be, yeah. because, you know, giving the opportunity for other folks, other brokers to, to show up, other agents to come and, and know it, you know, when, when they've got a client, that's that's where it's going to come from. So, yeah, when I, again, when I was an agent in, in California, that was the one thing that I saw on the most successful listing guys uh, 
they always always held a broker open um they they got excitement you know they they it cost the the best way to buy by the way to to do a broker open is to have have a have a bunch of food the broker opens that didn't have food nobody showed up for nobody went to those (laughs) yep and the broker opens that had a nice little catering that you probably spent a couple hundred bucks on brought everybody in and and those houses really tended to sell fast so it's you, you know you never think about those things, but those are it's actually pretty important. In in my town, we have a uh, they call it the tour. There's like probably two dozen agents that get together every Wednesday. You know they just go all together from different brokers. I mean I, I'm in a small area, and they just go and look at every single new property that came on the market in the past week, or at least every you know uh, one within their you know whatever niche that they're in. And that that's one of my favorite things about listing with an agent is exactly that. Almost every property I've sold has come as a result somehow of an agent who had walked through the house during that tour. So I think it's huge. Yeah, like I said, I, I've gotten um, a, a lot more traction from those than I have, like, you know, the consumer open houses. Yeah. Um, at least, uh, yeah, I think at least two places sold to an agent that went through one of those, or, you know, to a client of an agent who went through uh, one of those that we did. So, um, yeah, I definitely like doing that. And always when I talk to the agents, I ask them to do that. Cool. Well, hey, let's go. Let's go back to flipping a little bit and talk more about your kind of strategy with that. So, first of all, what kind of properties are you flipping? What are you looking for, condition wise or or size wise, those kind of things? So, I actually cast a pretty wide net, um, both like geographically and in what kind of properties I'll do and what level of rehab I'm willing to do. Um, essentially. The deal flow is small enough that I'm willing to chase dollars and go pretty far out and do a, a variety of kind of things. So I, um, <clears throat> I have done. Let's see. Uh, this I haven't done anything smaller than a two bedroom house at this point, but I um, have told people I'm willing to look at you know like small. So as as I mentioned, I, I have some experience with condos, so those don't scare me even on the flip side. So I do tell people I'm willing to look at those like as small as, you know, one bedrooms if it's, you know, it's like in the city or something where people actually do buy those. Yeah. Um, and I have looked at up to small multifamily, two or three families for potential flips in areas where, you know, it's not uncommon to have owner occupants there. So like I said, I, I do a whole wide range there. But you know, for the most part, it's been two and three bedroom single families. Okay. Right on. Right on. Cool. And are they usually pretty, I mean, like nasty, ugly, you need to do a complete renovation or are they? Pretty- yeah, pretty much. They- there's, there's some exceptions. I have, I had one place, um, that was kind of funny. So I, um, I had put in a bid on this place. It was a HUD property. I put it a uh, bid on it without seeing it. I kind of do a lot of analysis, desktop analysis, just kind of putting in worst case scenarios and I'll throw in some offers based on that. So I got a, so they accepted my offer, which I was surprised about. I usually just hope to see like a counter offer. So I like rushed down to go look at the place and I, I had something like, I want to say I had like a $75,000 budget on the place and I, I walked in the front door and then I literally took a step back to look at the house number <laughs> to make sure I was in the right house because it was so not that bad. Mm, that's um, awesome. Which was kind of funny because if you anybody who um, knows about so as I said I'm an agent and um, I'm a HUD registered agent so like basically my office has a set of keys that work with all the HUD locks for the places all, all around the state so like I had a key to the front door yet I still was so shocked that I, <laughs> I took a step back to see if I was in the right place. Nice. Okay, so you know on on show thirty eight with Travis Daggett. Uh, we we talked a lot about uh, HUD homes and and uh, making offers on them and, and it's kind of cool that you're a you're a HUD agent. Um, so we we kind of get to see uh, what it's like from from your perspective as well. Um, maybe you could dig in a little bit on on the HUD process really really quickly for those who may not have listened and may be unfamiliar. Um, just like what's HUD, how does it get listed, and and you know how would you make an offer on a HUD home? So, you know where would you find these things? So, um, being that I am an agent and my brokerage is registered with HUD, it's very easy to um, deal with those properties because um, <clears throat> you have. If you want to put in an offer, you have to put it in through a HUD registered agent. So, you know, if you're not an agent or if you're an agent and your brokerage isn't registered with HUD, then you have that extra step to go through. And then all the stuff that we were just talking about, as far as like knowing the other agents by you know putting in too low offers and that sort of thing. Uh, since I don't have that hang up, um, it's 
if you can put in your own offers, it's like ridiculously easy. It's like a, essentially it's just a one page form that you have to fill out for the property. You can't put in any particular contingencies. You just have to fill out the basic information. I can put in a HUD offer in less than two minutes once I do the evaluation. That's cool. Uh And I do that a lot and put in a lot of them. And I put the, and I put in ridiculously low offers that I don't expect to ever get, um, accepted i'm just hoping to get like a counter offer that's like within the realm of possibility so i'm assuming you don't go look at these properties first then right i don't think i've ever looked at a hud property before i put an offer in on it okay yeah is there is there a danger uh you know like like putting in too many lowball offers for an agent they're gonna say you know go away stop making these offers uh is there a danger that hud stops responding to you because you're that annoying guy who always puts in these awful Lowball offers. It seems, for the most part, to be re- very automated, and it doesn't re- seem to matter. Um, there, there was one time I got an email from somebody at the one of the asset management companies asking if I knew how to pu- how to use the system because my offer was so low. <laughs> I think I offered like twelve hundred bucks on a place that was listed at one hundred and twenty thousand. That was you. You really do lowball offers, okay? <laughs> Well, basically, if I if I spend the time to well for a HUD, yeah, yeah. this is not the same on every particular place. But like I said, yeah, since I don't see any ramifications, um, if I bother putting in, uh, if I do the evaluation, I'm putting in an offer. Yeah, no matter how stupid it is. Well, I think that's an awesome um, strategy to do. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to spend the time anyway, and you find out what that final number is that you should offer, why not throw it in? At least you never know what might happen. Yeah. Well, what's funny with that? So like. I I will resubmit offers every once in a while. uh, Like, you know, even if I only, um, what I generally do is like I increment it up a dollar just so like I know, you know, they're looking at my most recent offer or something. Uh, That is if I don't have any other reason to change it. But um, for so for this particular one, um, uh, after they after they like said that I didn't put in more offers on it, but they kept sending me counter offers for weeks. So I'm like, well, you know what? If you're gonna keep countering my twelve hundred dollar offer, then I don't really feel bad about putting it in. Yeah. Wait. So you're so you're putting in, say it's a hundred thousand dollars. You put an offer at twelve. Uh, say say ten thousand, right? Say you made a generous offer, knowing you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So you put in this ten thousand dollar offer. Uh, they counter you at ninety five, and you counter them at ten thousand and one, and they counter you at what? Well, so like I said, it's a pretty automated system. What what they typically do is they just send out an email, like to basically anybody who put in an offer, being like, you know, we have decided this is the minimum net offer that HUD is willing to accept on this, and they basically just send it to everybody. And that's sort of what I'm looking. So if you put in an offer, you'll get that email generally. So that's sort of what I'm looking at. So, you know, like, yeah, I don't remember exactly what you said, but, you know, say the place is listed at 100000 you know, I put in a $10,000 offer. They come back and say, you know, not, not that, not as low as you, or as high as you have, but say they come back at like 70. Mm-hmm. So then I was like, okay, well, maybe if I go out there, you know, drive the neighborhood to see if I can, um, you know, if my ARV might be on the low side because I try to be conservative with that until I look at the property, obviously. And if maybe I can do my rehab, like the place I was talking about where, um, you know, I thought I was in the wrong house. Like, you know, my rehab budget dropped $50,000 as soon as I walked in the front door. (laughs) So like, you know, if I can tighten up the budget, maybe this will be workable. So that's kind of where, you know, that's when I'll start putting in the time. No. Is that is that seventy that they come back to you at? Is that hard and firm, or or is there a negotiation? Nope, they'll keep coming down. Nice. So how does that work? I mean, so if you counter again, do you get another standard? It's not really a counter. It's more kind of like you can resubmit an offer. Like it's not like when you deal with an agent, you can like verbally go back and forth and then yeah. just you know update the contract. It's like you just keep you would submit a new offer. If you you know if you wanted to get the property at the price that they said, you would just make sure that it netted out to the pro- the and it's a net amount, so like they take into account the commissions and closing cost credits and stuff like that. So, if you put in the offer so it nets out to the amount they want, then you know unless somebody else goes higher than that, you you're you're pretty much guaranteed to get it. I did that one time that I put in exactly what they asked for on the counter because they had just dropped the price and they said they would accept something like 10 grand under what the new price was. And it, it was pretty much like what my mayo was. Well, well, t- tell me about the, the counter then. Well, I'll, I'm going to call it a counter, right? The second yeah, offer, fine. third offer. Um, 15th offer. Yeah. Uh, well, when do you do it? Um, so for 
generally I try, I have it sort of on a weekly, every other weekly kind of cycle where if I already have, so like I said, unless I have some other reason to change my offer, I just sort of incremented up a buck just so like I know there, because um, actually on that very first property I was talking about, I j- adjusted my offer a couple different times and, or I guess once, um, and they actually accepted an earlier offer than the most current one. Which kind of got me, you know, I was indignant about that. But then I went and drove, I uh, looked at the property. And I was like, okay, well, it still works, even though this is like three grand more than what I most recently a- asked for. So instead of rocking the boat, I just did it. But so now what I do is I make sure I put in my rock bottom offer first, and then I'll increment up from there just to make sure, you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen again. And and ham- I'm I'm assuming that's worked. Yeah, it has. Okay, so you've closed. Well, because always my my most recent offer is always my highest now. Yeah, so yeah. that's the one that they're evaluating. You know, even if it is only higher by a dollar, it's still the highest. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, let's move on. What what is the like the cheapest home you've ever bought? And like, how how low can you go on these things? Um, well, so locally in Massachusetts, it would have been that um very first property I was talking about that was like around thirty four thousand. I actually bought another one. My most recent one a few months ago was um, also in that same thirty grand range, which, like I said, is ridiculously low in Massachusetts. They both of those needed more, much more work than like the cost of the work was much more than the price of the house. Okay, yeah. Um, but so as I mentioned, I do um, some out of state rentals. So in that market, things are much, much, much cheaper. Like even the very nice houses don't cost me that much. Um, the cheapest house I bought ever was two thousand dollars. I bought that at a tax sale in Pennsylvania. Wow. Uh, okay. So two thousand dollars, and that came totally without any kind of secondary liens or anything. Yeah, free and clear. Okay. Okay. Wow. And and what was that house actually worth? Um, it's probably worth somewhere in the low to mid twenties. Okay. Gotcha. But it's a, you know, like I said, it's a much cheaper market out there. Um, And also this place was inhabited when I bought it. So, you know, um, I'm actually in the process of trying to figure out what's going on with the people. If we're they're actually tenants who don't, I guess, have a current lease. So we're trying to see if they want to stay, if they want to go, if we're going to have to evict them. So that's a little bit up in the air. But, um, you know, obviously the place is fully inhabitable. If people are already living there, I'm sure it needs some work. But I'm kind of hoping to get them to stay for a slightly below market rent so I don't have to do turnover costs. Yeah. Did you did you buy that site unseen again? I'm guessing we well obviously we couldn't get inside. We did go around the outside, and you know for the most part the exterior was in pretty good shape. Um, it was hard to tell, like you know, didn't even want to peer in the windows once it was clear people live there. Yeah. Um, you know, you can at least do you can at least look in the windows of places that are vacant. But uh, you know, we saw people were living there. We saw you know the the electric meter moving and stuff like that. So we're like, okay, we're not gonna well, let's just get out of here before people call the cops for trespassing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you actually yeah, went, you did you actually go to the courthouse steps to buy that then? Um, that's not exactly how it works, but yeah, more or less, it was a you know an auction hall at the at you know the municipal building. Okay. But oh, yes, yeah, same kind of thing. Okay, well, same idea. Yeah. So then, what are these properties in this area looking like? You know, price wise or uh, you know condition like what what are you looking for down in in, in Pennsylvania? You said. Yeah, it's in western Pennsylvania, right near okay. Ohio. Okay. Like well west of Pittsburgh. Okay. So yeah, what do they look like down there? Um, you know, they they don't look too different from what I have up here. They're, you know, an older housing stock. Not super old. It's more like, you know, World War Two E, World War One, World War Two, which you know, given that given that I'm from New England, that's like new construction. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, nice. Um but you know, they're you know, they're pretty typical houses. They're you know, there's um you know, like every other place, you can have your really nice um, houses and you can have your really dumpy ones. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I'm looking at uh, there's some two bedroom places, but mostly you're kind of like three, one and a half, three, two type places, like pretty good square footage. Um, so what, kind the, of price, the, yeah, what kind of price range are you seeing? So the stuff that I'm looking at, because obviously I'm not looking at like the higher end stuff for rentals, um, you know, these places like in really good fully rehabbed condition or probably like, you know, in the thirties. And what are you picking uh, them up for? So I've gotten stuff anywhere from that $2,000 house to the most I've paid for a place so far was a fully rehabbed duplex for 37, five. Wow. And what are those renting for? Uh, the duplex I'm getting, what's it? Uh, total rent of about, uh, about a thousand. Okay. Yeah, that's great. 
Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, and then I had another place. Um, so this was a place I bought right off of MLS. It was move in, more or less move in ready. I did have to do a little bit of work to it, but it only cost me seventeen, and renting that for five seventy five. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Did have to put a little bit of work in, so I'm probably all in before getting rent for still under twenty, but probably more like you know eighteen and a half, nineteen. That's still pretty good. That's yeah, still pretty good. All right, Sean. So let's let's talk about mistakes. You know, we we all make them. You know, there, it, it's it's funny. I get I get these investors who will email me and say, you know, Josh, I have to close my profile because I talked about a mistake I made, and now nobody's going to take me seriously. Uh, and I'm like, listen, you know, if you're if you're a real real estate investor, you've made mistakes. You know, nobody's gonna is going to to give you any less credit um, because you've made mistakes. They'll, they'll they'll treat you differently if you're a liar. <laughs> you know, yes. I, I mean, I I closed a, a profile of somebody uh, today who you know was one of those. Hey, I've got a billion dollars in real estate available. Um, and at the same time, he's asking for money to help him flip a house. Yeah. You know? Well, right. uh, I don't know. That doesn't really work so well together. But uh, yeah, so don't do that, by the way, for anyone listening. Uh, don't. Quick tip. Quick, quick <laughs> tip. That was good. That was good. I might fire Brandon and bring you in. Hey, okay. Mm-hmm. You can take it. <laughs> yeah, but you're totally right. It's it's all about honesty. Like you can't, you know, you don't have to be an expert in everything. And like, you know, people make mistakes. They might say something wrong. But like, yeah, you have to be upfront and honest and try to be above board on everything. Yeah. So let's talk about mistakes. What what mistakes really stand out to you that that you've experienced um, in your career thus far? Well, one of my funniest mistakes is, so going back to that very first property that I talked about that I went to try to wholesale and eventually rehab. So when I was doing my evaluation, I had in my head the wrong place where the house was. So like I said, I hadn't seen the house. I was just doing um, you know, an online evaluation, you know, desktop rehab analysis based on the size of the house and, you know, doing comps on MLS, which doesn't necessarily tell you where the house is. Um, so I went to go put in my offer and like I had in my head that it was probably, you know, about 40 miles south of Boston. I put it in Google Maps and it turned out to be 90 miles west. Mm. So I had so I put I put in this offer on this house and I had absolutely no idea where it was. Nice. That's a pretty good mistake. Okay, that's a good one. So so uh, know where your properties are when you're making offers. That's a good uh, That is that, that helps. Yeah. I have never I haven't been that far off since. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, there's there's a good one. You got any others? Um you know, there's I mean, like I said, everybody makes lots of mistakes. I um I don't. I'm perfect actually. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep going. Uh around here we have um, a fair number of places that are still on septic systems. And um, we have pretty tight regulations around that as well. So I, um, I purchased a property that had, it's called a Title V. That's the name of the, you know, the law that you have to um, you know, have this past inspection to be able to resell a house, okay. um, unless you're a bank. Anybody, you know, everybody else has to have a pass when a bank doesn't. Um, so, but, so I bought one. Isn't it? Yeah. So I did buy uh, one of my HUD properties, had this past report. So I thought I was all set, didn't have to worry about septic, um, and I didn't do any follow-up. So you know, you can go to the Board of Health and like check the records and stuff like that. I didn't bother doing that because I had this past report. That's you know, generally all you need. And uh, when I went to resell it, the buyer's agent was looking up some other stuff on the house, just looking for some old permits and stuff. Because, you know, like I said, it was, um, it was a bank-owned property, so I disclosed that that's what it was. And I didn't have a good history on, like, how, how say, like, how old the roof was because we didn't do the roof. Uh, so she was looking for some, like, you know, old permits to try to get a gleam a better idea of that. And she noticed, quote-unquote, something seemed funny with uh-huh. the septic reports and eventually, like we had to dig it up and get it reexamined, and the board of health like started um, um, making other things. Thank God that it was in good enough shape; we didn't have to replace it. But I did have to do some repair work on it, and that was oh, about a ten thousand dollar overage that I wasn't expecting because you know I just had this report and you know I didn't verify stuff. So mm. you know the old trusted verif- but verify. Nice, nice. Yeah, that that could have been a dirty problem. Hey, yeah. be- before we go on to the you know the end of the show, I want to ask you about something that you kind of teased me on the email about, and that was a property you bought. You said that was 
uh, that you're not afraid of buying any type of property. And you said I, that a yeah, crazy one. I, I look at, you know, I don't get all hung up like a lot of people do on buying, you know, nice houses and nice areas like, you know, pfft, whatever. <laughs> um, so this one particular place I was telling you about, um, literally across the street was a sewer pumping station <laughs> in the, in the backyard where train tracks. And I mean like serious train tracks, like, and right in the backyard, like not even a hundred yards away from the back of the house. Ooh. And it was also in the flight path of the municipal airport for the city next door. Oh, um, it pr- and it's also probably is in a flood zone now. It wasn't at the time, but with the new maps, I wouldn't be shocked if it was because like down the street was. Um, and it also bordered um, a town. Hey, since we're gonna, since we like banging on towns, Lawrence, Massachusetts, one of the crappiest cities in all of Massachusetts. <laughs> it was it it bordered that like like literally. So you know, there was a sewer station, and then across the river was Lawrence. So being next to like one of the worst cities in the um the entire state was like only the fourth or fifth worst thing going for this house wow wow so what did you uh, do with this thing i renovated it and i flipped it okay okay so if you uh, my thing is like you know like i said i look i look at the i look at the prices so this was actually this was a funny story so i was looking at auction.com and it was you know probably like midnight one in the morning kind of thing and there was an auction that was ending the next day so you know even if i had this unhealthy obsession of looking at properties beforehand um i wouldn't have ha- i wouldn't have had a chance with this particular one but it was going at a ridiculously low price so this um it's uh the the town is north andover which has pretty good schools pretty high prices like based on the size of this house i was figuring it was a 250k arv and the opening bid was like sixty two thousand ish. This is Can't the one with the, re- the with the tracks behind yeah, it. Exactly that okay, one. Okay. So basically, I put a bid on it, being like, "Hey, it's never going to work." And then, like the next day, I get the email being like, "Hey, you were the high bidder." I'm what like, did you bid? It's sixty two. Oh, you bid sixty two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just I just put in the minimum bid. Um, so then I was like, "Oh, you know." So obviously, I'm just like super duper excited because, or well, at first, well. That's not true because whenever I have an offer, <laughs> and I always get scared. It's like, what did I miss? Yeah. Which obviously, in this particular case, I missed some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little, little due uh, diligence, right? Yeah. So I immediately, you know, went out there, got my contractor to come look at it. I had, um, as I said, I do a sight unseen budget, so I had a very high budget on the place. Just assuming that was probably the issue is that it needed tons and tons and tons of work. So I got out to the place, and essentially, my ARV dropped a hundred grand as soon as I pulled up to the house. And we went inside, but then it was actually in way better condition than we had expected. So then I was talking with the contractor. And it's like, okay, you know, this is a lipstick on the pig. What can we do to make everything right without having to, you know, there's certain levels of work you can do before you have to start pulling permits and update everything to modern code. Like we checked out all the plumbing and all the um, wiring and stuff. You know, there was no knob and two wiring. It had, you know, a, a, a circuit breakers, not a fuse box, all that kind of stuff. So like, you know, everything was working. Okay. Like obviously if there were major problems like that, we would have had issues. But like, you know, we didn't want to have to bring everything up to code by ripping down all the walls and stuff because it's also had a pretty bad floor plan. So we had to, you know, work with what we could without having to spend too much money. So we were able to come up with a reasonable budget, keeping it pretty low. And then, um, you know, basically was able to resell it, like I said, about $100,000 under what most other places in the town were going for. Like literally the places that were my direct competition when I listed it were like the the uninhabitable REOs and short sales that were still on the market. Nice. All right. So what were the final numbers? You paid sixty two. You put how much in? Uh, it was roughly like in the thirty range. All right. You're at ninety two, and we sold yeah, it for uh, hundred and sixty, hundred and fifty nine. Oh, that's not bad. In the end, it netted out because I also so that was one of the properties I listed myself because I didn't think I needed uh, an experienced agent to just underprice it by a hundred grand. Yeah. Um, so, including like the my portion of the commission, I made a little over thirty three thousand on it. Wow. That well, that's that's awesome. That's a that's a good deal. So so that that kind of shows you that uh, buying a a property with a sewer plant in the back, <laughs> railroad tracks in the front, or vice versa. Uh, next to crappy, what is it, L- Lawrence? Lawrence, 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 Massachusetts. Crap I grew up. up in Lawrence, New York, so you know. Um, but uh, yeah, all right. Well, the the people of yeah. Detroit are happy to hear this interview, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you could still make money. Yeah, I mean, so you know, my key to buying these troubled, 
let's call them properties is that you just have to buy them. You have to buy them like any real estate, you have to buy them. Right. But like, you know, in this case, you have to take all that kind of stuff into account. Um, you know, like I said, you know, these places, the, the uninhabitable REOs were selling for not much less than what I had my resale as because of these, you know, locational issues. Got so it. if I paid, you know, a hundred, you know, if I paid a hundred plus thousand dollars for the house, which actually it had been on MLS at 110. So like, you know, it could have, anybody could have bought it for that price, which was actually the cheapest place in the town at that time. Gotcha. But like, wouldn't have made any money. I actually would have lost money on it at that price. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so let's let's move on to our. It's time for the fire round. Fire round. The fire round. The fire round. These questions come from the Bigger Pockets forums, and uh, we we shout them out quickly at you, and you shout us some quick answers right. back. Uh, first question in today's fire round is. My handyman is ripping me off. What do you do? So obviously we're going to go and fire them, but how do how do we avoid this situation? I mean, you know, it's it's tough. I would say one of the hardest things to do in real estate is find good, reliable contractors down to like handymen. Um, I have been pretty lucky, and I have a really, really good contractor that I try to do as much work with as I can because uh, he works well with me, communicates good, and I think his prices are good. Um, you know, he he pretty much always comes in below what I um, have as my own estimates. <laughs> now, I, I try to be pretty conservative. So, you know, I, I kind of expect him to come in under, but like, you know, it's never been any kind of issue. I haven't, I have, you know, knock on wood, haven't had price creep yet, that sort of thing. Um, to be honest, I don't have a good handyman because I haven't ever been able to find one. <laughs> So I actually use the contractor on stuff that I probably should use a handyman on and probably I'm paying a little bit more because of that. But, you know, I actually have somebody who can do the work because I haven't just I have not been able to find a good one. Well, and that in itself is the tip right there is, just, you know, if you have to pay more money, you know, pay more money and find somebody that's reliable. And that yes, can do it, so. very true. Cool. All right. Next question. What color should you paint a kitchen in a flip? Same color as the rest of the house or something different? <laughs> I've gone a couple different ways. Um, I have gone like, you know, not, not, not super bold, but like, you know, different color scheme in the kitchens. And I would say sometimes it's worked out for me. Other times people have talked about how like, Oh, you know, we don't like this color and we might want to repaint it. And they try to use that as leverage. It's like, well, you know, sorry, you don't like it. I'm I'm not going to like knock 10 grand off the price of the house because you want to repaint the kitchen that I just painted. So we've actually gone more towards using the, the, um, you know, fairly neutral colors that we're using throughout the rest of the house there as well. All right. Uh, what's the best way to get started with no money? Uh, if you don't have any money, I have found if you can get a good deal, I don't have any trouble getting a hard money lender to finance pretty much all of it if you have enough meat in it. Okay, good. What's the best type of property to buy first? To buy first? Well, I guess it depends on what you're looking to do. Uh, like I said, I actually liked buying the condos for rentals because, like I said, it, it makes it a little bit easier getting your feet wet with property management. Okay. Right on. Right on. Well, we're going to cut this one a little bit short because I know you're a little short on time. Let's move to our famous is far. Nice. That was all Sean. That, that was, was all Sean. Sean. <laughs> all right, Sean. First question is, what is your favorite real estate book? So I'm going to be um, cliche like everybody else and say yes. that Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a big one. But actually, I kind of liked a few of the follow-up books like The Cash Flow Quadrant and The Guide to Investing was some pretty good ones. Oh, cool. right on. uh, I also like uh, Nothing Down, so the Robert Allen kind of classic. Yep. You know, I don't think a lot of that stuff is necessarily applicable anymore just because a lot of laws, laws have changed in the last like, 30 or 40 years, but it's still a good you know, kind of book to get your mindset. Yeah, I agree. All right, what's your favorite non-real estate business book? So again, going to be cliche, E-Myth. Okay, yep. Um, I also like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I know somebody mentioned on one of the recent podcasts. That's a great one. Yeah, definitely. That's a great way just to live your entire life, not just your business. There you go. And another one that I've liked recently is called Getting Things Done by David Allen. I love that Good book. Good stuff. Love GTD. That book. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good. We, Good. Yeah, we'll link Good. to those in the show notes. So. Yeah. Great. All yeah, right. Awesome. Uh, hobbies. Uh, hobbies. I beat you to it. <laughs> well, I have two small daughters, so that monopolizes most of my time. Yep. Um, but, you know, I do love that, like spending time with my family and playing with my kids and stuff. That really is my favorite thing. Um, you know, personally, the other th- I like sports. 
watching sports this part of my life, but cool. I enjoy that, you know. Go Red Sox, World Go Series. Go Mets. <laughs> Actually, we've got to be going to Game Six of the World Series tonight, so hopefully it's a win and they wrap it up. Yeah, we'll wow. see. This comes out in a few weeks, so we'll. Uh, yeah, a couple weeks. Yeah, mm-hmm. people will look back and either laugh right now or uh, yeah, yeah, I'll cheer you on. All right, final question: What do you believe sets apart the successful investors from those who uh, end up giving up and failing? I think that's exactly it. Is just sticking with it. Okay. If you, you know, uh, you do see people like in the forums talk about, oh, I sent out this, you know, I sent out 500 letters and I didn't even get like one good lead out of it. It's like, you know, you just got to keep following up. You just got to keep making offers. I mean, I made probably 600 offers before I got that first like wholesale slash flip property under contract. I, I, my hit rate is terrible. Now I told you I put in a lot of low offers, but you know, my hit rate is pretty low on that. So I've put out thousands and thousands of offers to buy dozens of properties. That's cool. Uh, I mean, it's a, you it's know, a strategy. I actually, yeah. So um, I actually always say there's two kinds of real estate investors. Um, those that make a ton of money and those who give up too soon. Yep. That's good. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I like that, that quote. That That's a tweetable that topic. We'll add it yeah. in. And I know I, I definitely couldn't do it. Do it your way, man. I, 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 I wouldn't have the fortitude to put in thousands of offers. That's, that's <laughs> tough. It's really hard. Yeah. You got to have a pretty thick skin because you definitely get people mad at you and you definitely, <laughs> uh, you know, get a lot of rejection. And like I said, some of the properties I buy that, you know, the sewer play place, shockingly, you know, there were issues that came up and, you know, had to deal with them. So, yeah, you know, it is definitely easier to just buy the three to 1800 square foot with an attached garage in a nice neighborhood type places. But, you know, (laughs) different strokes for different folks. Exactly. For sure. For sure. All right, Sean. Well, listen, we, we, we want to thank you a lot for, for being on the show. We definitely appreciate it. And, uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you back on the site. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. And one last quick tip. Yes. Anybody who is listening to this who is not a Bigger Pockets member, go to the site. It is an awesome site. And it's going to have all the information that you need to learn about to get started in real estate investing. Josh and Brandon did not ask me to do this. I didn't even <laughs> tell them I was going to do this. Totally unsolicited. Um, nice. Little, little strange. <laughs> oh, thank kind you very of much. Sta- kind of stalkerish. <laughs> no, no, no. I great. love you guys. Uh, hey, thank no, you thanks. very much. I appreciate it, man. We well, do. thanks so much. And uh, it's been good. Right, well, thank you guys. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. So that was Sean Riley. Lots of uh, lots of cool stuff in that show. We 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 jumped around a little bit, but there there's a lot of a lot of fascinating little little tidbits. Uh, definitely hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we we appreciate you listening to the show, guys. Um, Make sure you connect with uh, you know Sean over on Bigger Pockets too. So send a call yeah. request and uh, jump into the show notes and ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Sean's Sean's pretty active on the site. He's active on the forums. Very active on our member blog area as well. So so yeah. uh, be sure to interact. Otherwise, as always, you know, thank you. Uh, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bigger Pockets. Twitter twitter.com slash Bigger pockets we're on g plus we're everywhere else and and come uh, hang out with us on bigger pockets as sean suggested and uh that's about it brandon i appreciate having you as a host you you're uh, you're you're really great to work with man even if i can't say massachusetts look at that oh you did it <laughs> nicely done my friend well, you, why man. don't you why don't you take it out this time seriously i i think seriously I'm this you. time Ser- seriously this right. uh, is Brandon signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from biggerpockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Damn it, Newman, I couldn't even get the intro right.